Good afternoon, good morning, good evening. I can hear some uh, church bells uh, ringing, so I guess uh, it's time for us to start. Um, I'm Ernesto Galvão. I'm a research group leader here at the International Idea and Nanotechnology Laboratory, INL, in Braga, Portugal. I'd like to welcome all of you attending online to the seventh uh, Quantum Portugal Initiative Lecture. Uh, these lectures are a series of live webinars that we organize here at INL uh, on the emerging field of quantum science and technology. It is my pleasure to introduce you uh, to today's speaker, Dr. Jay Gambera. Jay got his PhD from Griffith University in Australia in 2004, then spent time as a postdoc at Yale and IQC in Waterloo, Canada, prior to joining IBM in 2011. Uh, he was elected a fellow of the American Physical Society in 2014, and named an IBM Fellow in 2018 for his work on superconducting qubits, quantum validation techniques, quantum codes, and near-term applications of quantum computing. Since 2019, uh, Jay has been IBM's Vice President for Quantum Computing, and under his leadership, IBM has made breakthroughs in the quantum computing industry, from the software development kit, uh, Qiskit, uh, to making available tens of cloud-based cloud IBM quantum experience superconducting chips which many of us here at INL know and we use uh, in our research. Jay has over 130 scientific publications, which have been cited over 23,000 times. I see we already have uh, many attendees. So uh, if you have questions, please post them on the chat channel here at Zoom, and then I'll, I'll get some of these questions and, and, and post them to, for Jay at the end of the talk. So without further ado, let me invite Dr. Jay Gambetta to give his talk on the future of quantum computing in the cloud. Uh, Jay, thanks again for accepting our invitation. The stage is yours. Please feel free to share your screen. All right. Thank, thank you, Ernest, for, for inviting me. It's my pleasure here to give a talk. Um, I'm going to give you a bit of view of my overview of quantum computing from my, my own lens and talk about some of the interesting problems that we're doing as well as uh, how we see it evolving going forward. Uh, let me just bring up my slides and start them. OK, I assume that is uh, showing nicely on the screen. We can see it full screen, yes. Thanks. So as, as was said, about in 2016, um, we decided to take our technology and, and place it on the cloud. This um, was inspired for multiple reasons, one of them being that uh, I felt at that point in time, it was appropriate for us to be able to allow others to use our, our machines. I remember I had many theorists that would uh, want to work with us and, and uh, said it was difficult because we would have to describe it and then implement it. And so I thought, well, let, maybe it's time that we put this technology online. And what I'm very proud of is not doing this back then, but now seeing that there's been over 500 papers using this. And today we get over 2 billion uh, quantum circuits run. Uh, using our machines, which just shows how much demand there is for access to quantum computing. So as, as I've evolved in my career, I've gone from someone that really focused on, uh, on, the, on building, um, doing the physics to more of our designing systems. And I put this in just to sort of say, look, the way we look at, and I look at these systems now, is you're building a full system. And when you build a full system, you have to think of many other types of uh, parts that come into it, um, the control, reliability, uptime. And it's a really different way of looking at it. So I, I, I see that I've uh, transitioned more into more of an engineering uh, than a physicist, but though I still keep doing some physics stuff. So today, as was said, we have many systems. This is just a snapshot. Uh, from a couple of days ago, that there's 24 systems uh, online that are work, and they range uh, from single qubits all the way up to 65 qubits, and there's various different combinations of them. We have a philosophy that we would like to put our latest best online and give access to our um, premium users so they can do science with them. And so this allows us to keep sort of iterating through and you see that in various uh, versions of these, you've got um, different iterations of the same, like there's a Falcon R4 and an R5. That shows how we iterate through and bring new technology into the systems. So as I said, we like to do our science on it just to show that our premium systems are capable. Here's a sort of a, a zoom in to the Calcutta system. 
and that this is one of our latest ones it's actually a, a falcon which is a 27 qubit um um uh off uh, five system and in here basically you see that the t1s are quite quite impressive readout errors are getting down very small and the c knots are getting uh now getting to the 10 to the negative three range and using all these uh, premium systems we've done many different experiments from uh doubling uh improving our quantum volume which i'll talk about later to looking at different types of advantages and to and to looking at machine learning chemistry and uh, just some uh, computational type problem as, as an example. And then just to show, and before I get on to the main part of my talk, that I was very happy to see at the APS this year that there were 46 uh, scientific papers that were presented using these systems. And this really shows how much science has, is getting done by bringing science to, 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 the, to the users like yourselves. For example, his, his work that was by a group in Australia that looked at trying to entangle the systems and to show the largest entanglement on the system. They, with the 27 qubits, they showed um, completely entangled GHC states. And then with uh, uh, the 65, they looked at all the possible ways that you could have nearest neighbor entanglement and showed that they could come up with and um, basically entangle quite a lot over the device. They looked at different ways of uh, improving the entanglement through uh, error mitigation and things like this, but ultimately um, they showed that there was entanglement in the systems and, and um, put a method for doing characterization of these large devices. So on that, I'll give you a bit of an introduction of how I see computing so and, and quantum computing in general. So computing, um, obviously has been amazing. Our whole society is based on it uh, from the first uh, PCs up, uh, to, to basically the large uh, uh, GPU driven clusters we have today. But I don't wanna go too much into all the details <coughs> for all the systems that are in here, other than say that all of these were improvements of the current model of computation. And with quantum computing, I like to say it's the first time in the history of computing that it's branched. And when we look back, we'll have um, now basically we'll refer to what we call classical computing as one class and quantum as another. And I think the future is going to be a heterogeneous combination of the both of them. But I, I think it's important for us to recognize that we're actually seeing a branch, not a continual improvement in, in, in computing. And by this, I just take the, the famous uh, Shaw's, um, Shaw, uh, Shaw problem. And so... For, for the, I'm sure all of you know this. Uh, if you were to just to multiply two numbers, p times q, on a on a quantum or a classical computer, you do estimates of how fast it takes to do the multiplication on classical, or how fast you could do it on a quantum. This is obviously a prediction; it can't be done yet uh, um, because of the nature of multiplication uh, requiring certain types of circuits that are still difficult for us to run. Um, you would uh, you would see that the difference would is is not much, and actually a quantum actually would do this type of multiplication uh, much much slower. <clears throat> However, if you do the reverse of it, and this is the core to encryption, it's just ridiculous to calculate it classically. I think uh, um, the 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 best examples are still these two that are on this uh, slide, and doing uh, a seven hundred ninety five bit uh, took took 4,000 CPU years. And if you were to estimate that with a quantum computer, assuming various different ways of doing error correction, it could come down to eight hours. And this, you see the difference in the exponential. You see something that is ridiculously long to something that is short. So what is quantum computing and how do I think of it? Well, I actually think of it very similar to classical computing. I think of it as you have to have an initial state Sorry, just trying to minimize the boxes. You have to have, be able to put it into some initial state. It has to evolve by a sequence of operations and there has to be a mechanism to extract information, okay? So that, that is the same, but there's two, when you go to quantum, there are two new principles that go onto it. And that I, I like to give a little comic way of uh, uh, demonstrating them, but, um, these two new principles is the most important uh, principles to get your head around for quantum computing, in my view. 
the first is um I like to say, and this was inspired and the credit should go to Charlie Bennett, who is another IBM fellow at um, uh, IBM that, that I work with. Um, and I'm sure many of you know, uh, one of the um, founding, uh, founding scientists uh, that created the field of quantum information. So the first is a physical system in an imperfect definite state can still behave randomly. So what do we mean by that? Well, imagine you have this operation We'll call it H at the moment. I'm not going to say anything about it other than it flips. It's You can think of it as the quantum version of a, a coin flip. If I was to apply this operation, I would expect that I get 50-50, much like I flip a coin. Now, if I was to apply this operation twice, if it was a coin flip, I would expect still to be 50-50. 50-50 on the first, 50-50 on the second, and so on. But when we do it quantum mechanically, we find that it is no longer random. So then this comes back to the principle at the start. The start. Something determined uh, perfectly definite, as in this quantum state in the first case happens to be in a superposition. If I look at it, can actually be um, randomly. But if I try to look at it in a different basis and ask, are you in a superposition? I can get an answer where it becomes definite and I get that it's zero. And so <clears throat> the second is uh, entanglement, obviously. Two systems that are too far apart to influence each other can nevertheless behave in ways though, though individually random are somehow strongly correlated. So if you take this uh, this now, the simple circuit, which is just a Hadamard followed by a C naught, and I don't want to uh, go into the details of the C naught other than to say that it creates an entangled state. If I was to look at the first qubit, I'd find it was random. If I was to look at the first qubit, in a superposition basis, I would also find it was random. If I was to do it for the other type, the other qubit, I would find that. If I was now to look at correlations, I see that there's correlations of it both being in the zero, zero, or one, one, or both being in the, super, the same superposition state. So this says that the, the information, there's more information in the, uh, in the combined system than there are in the individuals. I know for this example, and for those that know the details behind it, um, there can be uh, can be uh, ways to type of explain this, but as we generalize this up further, this type of correlation puts more information in the combined system. And when this all comes to comes together, you can think of it mathematically as a quantum phase. The ability that on a qubit I can put this uh, phase is the is the part that gives me this interference. This interference that can make something definite and random by applying multiple operations of it, i.e. I can have this negative, uh, the phase can be chosen to be a negative sign. And if you scale this up, the entanglement gives you the correlations and you get quantum is very much like uh, probability theory, it exponentially scales, but in probability theory, there are efficient ways that you can simulate this exponential. However, in quantum, there are not efficient ways to be able to simulate it. And so like Scott Aronson has said, before, it's like probability theory with the minus signs. So quantum is giving you the ability to do interference and entanglement, and it is these two extra principles that matter for quantum computing. And just to state it once more, to mimic entanglement requires exponential classical record uh, resources. Quantum computation is the only way to access these new resources. So. If we now make a transition and say, well, how do we actually program or how do we do operations on this? Well, it turns out that uh, there's well-defined theories that can come up with a universal set. Here is just an example of one universal set. Uh, it happens to be uh, the one that consists of the Hadamard, a phase shift, which uh, uh, comes in and does each one of these random, uh, each one of these different phases by applying just a phase on the one state and the C not gate which flips the second qubit if the first qubit is in the one state. And by a combination of all these gates, you can build any larger gate. And this comes to um, basically how, how we in the field think of quantum computing is we have this uh, ability, if I have some problem, I hope that I've got some classical algorithm that's efficient, that can turn it into a bunch of these quantum circuits. These quantum circuits, then I hope that they are polynomial in the size of the problem. And if that is true for that class of problems, we call them BQP, there exists a quantum solution that can do them faster in polynomial time, which we believe will be more efficient than the classical analogy. So 
I, I want to say it all comes down to these quantum circuits and it comes down to being able to do these quantum circuits. However, there are a little bit of a uh, little bit of uh, points that I want to add to that, uh, to the trans, uh, the, the traditional model of a circuit. I want to be able to extend it. Uh, a famous example of extending the traditional circuits is teleportation. Um, and basically what, what it turns out is if I can bring uh, into a circuit the ability to do classical computations, then I can increase what can be done. For instance, any Clifford operator uh, can be written as a, as a short, a short, much, much shorter circuit uh, if it can be done, if I have this ability to do classical. And in the middle here, I have an example of uh, if I was to create it a big entangled state here by just doing a swap network. Uh, here I take the Hadamard first and I, I create it in the superposition, then I entangle with a C naught and I, and I go each, each way creating a, a large state that is zero, 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 plus one, one, one. This, uh, this is obviously going to be proportional uh, to the number of qubits uh, of the depth of how long it's going to be. Well, this can be actually done in constant depth. If I can come in and between each one of the qubits measure their parity and then feed forward, I can, I can create this state in, in constant depth. And this sort of shows that this, uh, this sort of, even though they're equivalent, I can get a much more, uh, much more efficient ways of doing it. And there are other examples, like the famous for a transform can be done in constant depth if I can have the ability to do measurement feed for it. So even though this is beyond the uh, circuit model, these class of circuits, we call them dynamic circuits, are very important and they, they need to go into how we extend circuits. And to give an example, <coughs> sorry, uh, and I'm not suggesting this is, uh, this, is, this is the way you should do it because it's a very trivial example. If you take the bernstein Vazanari algorithm and you, if you were to run it uh, because of the way the algorithm is written, uh, where basically all the qubits are C-knotted to a single qubit and you measure, uh, you measure the output, you would find that essentially if I was to do it without uh, doing this, do, taking this algorithm and running it on, say, uh, our, uh, our standard architecture, it actually uh, goes really, really bad. And this is because um, to, to, to do this type of non-nearest interaction, you have to insert lots and lots of swaps, and those swaps uh, come with loss. And so um, here, here you could make the argument that architecture matters. Obviously, ions, uh, which have, have the ability to do any type of gate, they don't see this architecture dependence. However, by giving you the self uh, the access to feed forward, uh, you can obviously map it down to a trivial example and you can get the same type of outcome and it can show you the advantages of giving you this feed forward. And so it can you can now reuse qubits in this algorithm, feed forward the result and, and such and go forward. And so this, uh, sorry, there's no feed forward here. This is just reuse reusing the qubits. So this demonstrates that giving the ability to put some classical in is, is needed uh, to get uh, higher fidelity circuits in the near term. We can even go further. And for those that know, um, the, the quantum Fourier transform, uh, sorry, the quantum phase estimation is a fundamental uh, algorithm that's very important uh, for uh, many, many applications of quantum computing. Um, there are multiple different ways of implementing it. Um, two of my favorite, uh, the standard, um, the, the Kataev way of splitting it up into different circuits. And for each one of them, for every bit, you run a single circuit and then you post-process the results, run a new circ circuit for the cos and sine part, post-process the results. And then by doing that, you can get it, you can extract uh, an estimate of the phase of this unitary operator U. You can do this iteratively uh, where you feed forward the result. And so now you are um, basically for each, um, each one, you, you iteratively correct the phase of um, <coughs> a phase gate that is applied before you measure. And this gives you a way of um, looking at it. These are equivalent and we experimentally showed that they do track and, and basically give the same result. But it shows that in this, uh, in this era that we're in now, by giving you the ability that you can feed forward, you can, you can now investigate the trade-offs between being able to run a circuit that's much longer 
using less qubits by running multiple different circuits and post-processing the results. And you get to um, trade classical and quantum to, a, to look at what is the same, same result. And here um, we, we, we observe that for um, basically limited number of resources using feed forward uh, gave you a slight advantage. But as soon as those resources got up to a reasonable number, um, the coherence and other effects came in and they basically tracked the same. But nevertheless, it gives you a way of ex uh, extending what is possible. And this brings me to my point is I think we need to extend what the quantum circuit is. And I, I like to call a quantum circuit is a computational routine consisting of current quantum operations on quantum data, i.e. qubits, and concurrent real-time classical computation. So the ability to do this measurement feed forward etc. It is an ordered sequence of gates, measurements, and research, which may be conditioned on the use of data from the real-time classical computation. So given that definition of an extended quantum circuit, this is what we uh, basically try to do, try to make the way that we measure and look at our type of systems. Okay. <coughs> so before I go forward, um, I wanted to say there, in my view, there are three important things to measure how, how we are progressing in, in, in quantum circuits. First is how the, you can think of it as the quality. How good are the circuits uh, representing quantum mechanics? We've come up with a metric, uh, we call it quantum volume for this. And um, you can think what we wanna do is here is keep showing that we're improving the fundamentals of the device physics to make sure that we're driving better and better circuits that obey quantum mechanics. The second is because I show, showed you that I can actually do some interesting things by mixing, and I'll, I'll give much more examples later, mixing classical and quantum is how fast can you run the circuits? Ultimately, I need to run these circuits at a really, really fast rate if I wanna do something useful. And then the third is um, what type of circuits can I run? If I can have more variety and I can integrate the classical real time in it, <clears throat> um, I can look at many different possibilities. And so that becomes an interesting direction to look. So this comes to why we choose superconducting qubits. Uh, I'm not gonna go into the physics of them much. Uh, I'm sure you've heard many talks and many people have uh, talked about them. They are made from um, they, they are just made from uh, standard fabrication material. And why I like them is they basically leverage uh, the CMOS technology that we've been doing, as well as the microwave technology. Furthermore, because I can engineer them, I can I can I can make them I can design them to have very very strong interaction rates, and I can design them to couple to readout resonators, and to uh, filters and other things such that I can reset them and I can measure them at a fast rate, allowing me to run circuits extremely extremely fast on these systems, and um, as we've progressed, whilst coherence. And, and things like this still become one of the challenge. We don't see any fundamental limit to continuing to improve these devices as we uh, get understand better and better um, what their limitations are. So they give us, in my view, a scalable system, uh, a system that give us access to high high circuits, uh, circuits with a high rate, uh, high rep rate, and they'll give us um, high quality circuits as we continue to improve the fundamentals. So <laughs> we laid out last year a hardware roadmap, um, and I'll, I'll go through a bit of the details of, of what, why we're confident in it and uh, what are some of the things that we have to do. But essentially the roadmap uh, uh, shows uh, that we're on, on our plan to go towards, uh, in 2023, 1,000 qubits. So 20 to the Falcon uh, chip which is our 27 qubit. So the reason why it has this architecture of, um, of uh, three interactions, two interactions, three interactions, two interactions, is because the gate that we run, uh, we call it a cross resonance gate, has an uh, asymmetry between the control and the target. And so by doing this type of, uh, of patterning, we can leverage uh, this uh, asymmetry and it gives us the ability to to more flexibility in choosing which uh, qubits can be the con uh, 
the qubit frequencies. The second thing that enabled this device was solving uh, what is what is what is the what, is the, what we call a yield problem. So the, these are made from superconducting qubits, as I said. One of the difficulties in superconducting qubits is getting the frequency exactly what you want. Um, and this is because the frequency is set by the Josephson junction thickness. And by basically having that different, uh, layering that just to natural fabrication uh, 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 fluctuations, this can actually, and this is what's shown in this bar graph in the red, this can have a medium frequency uh, that, that can be quite large, anywhere from 5.4 uh, to 5.9. And if we wanted to get the qubits uh, close to give high interaction, close being say 200 megahertz, this fluctuation means the likelihood of those qubits having a collision is quite high. So what we had to develop and what's highlighted in this paper was a technique where we would come in after we'd make a device and use the laser to adjust the qubit frequency. And by doing this, we found that uh, we found that we could tune the qubits. And here we're showing we're either tuning this set of qubits to 5.4 or 5.7, but effectively it gave us a 10 time increase in the uh, tolerance of being able to work with these systems. And now you can imagine we could place say half the qubits at 5.4, then the nearest neighbor at 5.7 and stack them across the device and we won't have a collision problem. So this essentially solved the yield and most of the systems that we build today, are, are what we have extremely high yield. They work with, um, with, with almost uh, one yield. Okay, <clears throat> to get to the 65, we had to solve the problem of um, the first 50 qubit device we made. We had um, we had an amplifier per qubit, and so now if you've got an amplifier by qubit, the amount of componentry around your system dominates it. So by coming up with techniques that we call multiplexing, and here is just showing uh, eight different uh, readout cavities through one amplifier line that is multiplexed with one single uh, base. We call it a Purcell filter. Um, here you can see that each one of these readouts can uniquely be observed and this gave us an eight to one multiplexing. So the 65 amplifiers would reduce down to eight, which is a, a number that is manageable. And, and this multiplexing will allow us to scale up to the hundred, uh, the thousands of qubit numbers in standard component trees. So before I go on to the future systems, as I said, the other variable that's important is uh, the quality of the systems. And the way that we measure the quality, oops, sorry, is uh, by this technique we call quantum volume. And quantum volume is not, um, I, I don't want it to, um, I don't want to say it's an absolute or the only measure to measure, but I, I think of it as, when you've got a large system, you want to look at things in a very holistic way. And so here, what we intend to do is randomly apply random two qubit gates between random pairs of the device. And we want to measure how long is the, how, how big in width and depth of a random circuit can we run? And we, uh, we, we, we define the condition that uh, the threshold when it, when you can measure a, a effective output we, uh, that is above a threshold of 0.666, we um, call that success. And the largest depth and width that you can do to do that defines uh, your quantum volume, essentially. So why why is it a good measure? Well, you. Well, it gets at every aspect of, um, of, of what comes in to actually trying to do a quantum circuit. So you can come up with a, a new gate, a, the direct C0, and you could measure it with high fidelity, but you might find that its idle errors uh, affect its neighbors. So by just measuring a two qubit gate, that's not enough to tell you how it's gonna work. So to go from 32 to 64, we had to, do a multiple of four different things. The first was um, to, <coughs> to come up with um, better compilers, which suggests that there's so much work 
that needs to be done in the compiling side of uh, quantum computing and to work out basically how you can represent an arbitrary gate more efficiently on given hardware. Um, a more efficient uh, two qubit gate uh, this example we called was called direct C naught. Uh, what it did is it removed the um, echoing sequence um, in doing this eight time. By hand. But um, whilst doing this, we also had to introduce uh, what we call dynamical decoupling. Uh, sorry, what the field calls dynamical decoupling, which is the um, inserting uh, different types of gates that will echo away um, in, uh, weak interactions between uh, qubits at different places in the circuit. And then we developed a different type of readout mechanism where you would drive uh, before readout drive one to the F state. And this gives you a bigger uh, contrast for doing the measurement. And these four combinations uh, went together to basically drive to 64. To go to, to 128, we just improved the compiler a bit more by coming up with more techniques that uh, took into account uh, which C, the C uh, which C knots work better and uh, compiled to use the better ones more often than the ones that didn't work uh, uh, work as good. And so this sort of we call a hardware aware compiling by using the best uh, best best gates more often than the ones that are not as good as well as improving the readout even more by um, putting machine learning to techniques in there to do um, linear discriminator or quadratic discriminators uh, to give you even better ways of classifying, giving you an improvement in classifying the number. And so all this sort of shows that it's a very holistic way of improving the overall quantum circuit that can run. I like to show, show this because one of my colleagues I work with uh, points out if you ever wanted to explain quantum volume, it's like beating your head against a wall and uh, you have to keep doing it until you get through that, uh, that error. And then there's another one uh, coming up behind. So we, we've, we've committed ourselves that we want to show that we can keep doubling this each year and, we, and we, um, we're well on the way to doing that. So I hope that sort of shows that on the axis of scalability, what it was required to get up to 65 qubits. I gave you some views of how that was done and how we keep pushing the quality. Um, that This is what we've done with the quantum volume. So <coughs> going beyond. So beyond, uh, we call it the Eagle, which is a 127 qubit processor and the Osprey, the 433. So what, what matters for the Eagle and to make the Eagle successful is if you think about it, I have all these qubits here. If I was to come in and have all my control lines, I'm going to have an IO problem, and I'm not going to be able to get all of these qubits just by driving through a flip chip. Um, I'm going to have like, if I just draw lines, I'm going to have a line problem. So we had to develop a technique where in our interposer, which is our flip chip, we have what we call multi-level wiring and through silicon vias where we can take the wire, we can jump up to the next one, jump down, jump up, jump down, and so on. And this allows us to basically jump over different types of wires and allow us to build um, the packaging that can um, control these larger chips and will scale out to the thousand qubit mark. So this is working uh, and, and it works quite well. And so this gives us the technology that is uh, um, basically the limiting factor for these logic chips. Now, <clears throat> to go to the 433, you've probably seen many photos of quantum computers that have these, uh, these um, coax cables on, on it. If, you get, if you're going up to higher and higher number of qubits and you have basically uh, a line or three lines per qubit, you're, you'll get at the limit of the amount of lines that can come in, like it's just too much, uh, too much space. So you have to uh, come up with new technology that gives you an increased density to get more and more input into your uh, system. And the, the field is called this flex cables. And essentially these are like printed cables, but embedded in here are waveguides that allow many more lines to get into the system. It gives you about a 10 times increase in the density. Here's a cross section of the multi-level wiring, which, uh, which I described is key for making the Eagle and the larger systems possible. And here you can see the, the, the wiring down here and you can see basically you can pattern it. It has three layers, 
each one is well isolated. And by doing this gives you the technology possible uh, to, to basically address all the control problems you have on these systems. So going beyond that, and our goal is to get really, really high um, uh, fidelity gates on these larger devices. Um, we, we, the biggest limitation I see for the thousand qubit is actually um, achieving the rates that we want for its error rates. And to, <coughs> to do this, we have to go back in parallel and look at alternative different ways of doing more faster or more efficient gates. And the two different ways that we've been internally doing in our group yeah, is going back to um, our high fidelity uh, flux gates where we can do ZZ gates by basically driving a coupler between the qubits or keep, keep doing the cross resonance but come up with a way where we cancel unwanted coupling between the cross resonance by using a combination of direct coupler, uh, coupler and a pion 4 resonator. Both of these are working very well and showing about a five time improvement on the gate fidelities we get. Uh, without and uh, are well on the way of almost uh, getting to the low 10 to the negative three error rates. I think um, I think in the the the, the uh, in the in this one we were around one here that you can see it's about 2.3 by 10 to the negative three. So I think for quantum processes, my general thoughts is you have to do all these problems in parallel. Like I said, do gates now to know the gates that you're gonna use in the future, continue doing the coherence material science and stuff like that. The junction physics will always be a limitation for yield coming up with better ways to have less uh, variation in the junction. And then ultimately to go beyond the thousand, um, you need to come up with some way to interconnect between the chips and some modularity. We've started some of this in our group, but this is only one of many different ways. Here we're envisioning that we're gonna take um, microwave photons and couple them to optical using a silicon uh, geranium uh, resonator. And uh, obviously there's many things that we have to do to make this possible. But one of the first steps is to make a silicon germanium high Q resonator. And that's what the team has, uh, has, has achieved. And they achieved a 150 million Q uh, version of that resonator. Next is uh, to get the uh, microwave qubit to couple to it and ultimately to show that you can get uh, tran uh, uh, transduction between the microwave to optical. And then eventually we'd love to do what this cartoon depicts and connect two different types of uh, uh, cryostats uh, by an op optical channel. How much time do I have left? Uh, you can use up to like 15 minutes if you like. Uh, okay. So now I wanted to do a transition and, and the last 15 minutes and giving my views of what makes it hard, uh, what makes a circuit hard and how to do near-term applications and, and uh, what are our views and of what, what is important. So, <clears throat> so uh, uh, these two circuits here, right? The top one we believe is a circuit that's difficult to simulate. The bottom one is a circuit that is actually simple to uh, simulate. Uh, the difference between them is that the single cubic gates in, sorry, I said that the wrong way around. The top one is the easy one, the bottom one is the harder one. The difference is that the single cubic gates in the top are represented uh, just as it's all Cliffords, whereas in the bottom, we've allowed single qubits outside the Clifford and kept all the two qubits. So it's very hard to say what is hard for a circuit, it needs to have a lot of entanglement. If it doesn't have a lot of entanglement, you're you're going to uh, you're going to um, basically um, have tensor network methods that work very easy. It has to have the ability to use those negative signs that I talked about at the start. Otherwise, there will be uh, efficient methods like quantum Monte Carlo, and it has to. Um, uh, be complicated otherwise, uh, like if it doesn't have the full single cubic gates as the Clifford. So because of this, what we tried to do when we've done applications is make sure we develop all our applications based on the circuits being the reason why we should see some quantum advantage. So the complexity hardness of the quantum circuit is the reason why we, we drive to look at applications that can do some computation. Driven by this, there was this paper by Sergey Bravi, David Gossett, and Robert Coyne, 
which showed there is quantum advantage with shallow circuits. They come up with this nice way of looking at this uh, GHC type puzzle game, uh, sorry, three body um, puzzle game. But uh, how can we sort of extend this? So uh, let's imagine the problem of uh, machine learning. And you might say, well, what's it got to do with circuits? Um, I'll, I'll try and give you my, my intuition for it and, and the work that we've been doing here. So <clears throat> you got this uh, machine learning problem and I, I got two different types of colors. If I've got these uh, classical problem and I want to classify it, there's a standard technique um, uh, that I can do where I can enlarge the space. And this is called a feature space. Um, and here I'm obviously going to a quadratic. And now a linear line easily separates it, right? So I took this line and then I made it quadratic, could find a linear line and separate it. So now I know light blue is always uh, to the left, dark blue is always to the right. So is there a quantum equivalent to this? And so what, 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 we, what we looked at and, and, and our view of it is yes. And so we, what we said is we imagine you got some data and you wanna be able to map this data to a quantum state that depends on that data. We call this a feature, uh, feature space, right? So here I see an X data is mapped uh, to this uh, quantum operator that represents the data. Now I can estimate a kernel. And so a kernel is just the inner product between this data all squared. Um, if I can estimate this kernel, I could do it either by doing a, um, um, a swap test uh, by basically measuring the output, depending, putting the two states in and doing a swap. Or I could rotate, uh, run the circuit forward, forward and then backward by the data X and, and backward by the data Y and measure the overlap, uh, the projection into zero. Then I can attain this kernel. If I can attain this kernel, then I can use um, my standard, um, <coughs> sorry, my standard classical techniques that just apply and I assume this kernel comes of uh, turning this into a, a problem as, as a, a linear problem, a quadratic problem, sorry. And then I can assign the right, the right, the values depending on this kernel. So the assumption is that this kernel has to be, if there's gonna be any reason to believe that you're gonna be quantum advantage or a quantum, quantum application using it, is this kernel must be difficult. And that comes back to the statement that this underlying circuit uh, must be complex, otherwise there is a classical method to do it. So what we observed is um, most of the quantum neural network heuristics can be mapped to this type of feature space. Uh, the quantum phase is not detectable in this type of circuit and we, uh, and we need to use um, kernels uh, where additive error. And the details of this is we originally thought IQB circuits uh, could be a candidate, but because of additive error, we. Uh, they, they still become easy to simulate the detail that I don't need to go into. But essentially um, we needed to use kernels that are made from circuits that are not easy. As an example, a trivial circuit of single qubit rotations, uh, you, can show, <coughs> you can easily show has, has no, no, no uh, avenue towards having a future of quantum advantage using these. However, if you can use circuits that come from families that can be difficult, then it might be possible. And this is what we did in, in, in this paper is we took circuits uh, from what we call our correlation circuits inspired by Scott Aronson. Um, and these consist basically of multiple layers of um, complicated ZZ functions embedded between Hadamas. And in each one of these is where the data was encoded. I'm not gonna go into the details of the experiment because the actual data chosen and and it working, uh, the actual data chosen wasn't the point. The point is that we built, we showed that uh, a quantum SVM was possible using these kernels based on circuits that we believe to be difficult to simulate. And it worked in experiment with high fidelity. So then you can ask, well, can I generalize this? And it turns out you can generalize this to arbitrary groups and just Without time, I don't want to spend too much time on this. Um, and now the difficulty becomes, well, now I might have some rotation that depends on, 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 on the data X. And, and so, uh, sorry, X twiddle and X here. The difficulty is calculating the fiducial state that I put into this problem. And so 
um, you can prove, obviously, the team proved that you can embed, um, you can now by doing this uh, structure, you can embed root uh, hard problems. The team proved that you could actually embed uh, uh, the mod, uh, multiplication, uh, which is, you can think of it as embedding Shaw's algorithm in a kernel. And so you can prove there exist difficult kernels that you can never do. And then what we looked at in a recent paper as well, we took the kernels that were based on graph states here as a graph state. And we said, well, in general, you need, you may not be able to find the fiducial state, but you could use a classical algorithm by minimizing, an, again, an efficient um, classical quadratic program that depended on the kernel for each one of these lambdas. And you could use the quantum computer with the classical computer to find the fiducial state that is the optimal fiducial state for the, um, the, for the group encoding of the data that you chose. And it turns out that this worked experimentally and it, it, found, it, found, it found the right one. But this sort of shows that there, this mixing between classical and quantum and, and relying hopefully on hard circuits that allow it to be done. So on that, I don't want to go into the details. There are many other examples, but I think I just wanted to conclude by saying what I see us needing for quantum computing is we need a framework where a user has access to classical and quantum. This has to be run in the milliseconds to allow it to be run very fast inside this quantum processor needs to have extended quantum circuits. So it needs to be able to do real time uh, classical calculations. And this is what we've uh, put together um, as we've built out the new um, new stack for the quantum computing computers that we give access to uh, all of you. We've redefined exactly um, the amount of quantum circuits that can be, uh, we've defined the extended quantum circuit essentially through this uh, open chasm three. And this is a, the, the new specification uh, that we've put out that it will allow you to do a more, the more generalized circuit. And we've developed a new containerized technology that allows you to um, basically, we call this a Qiskit runtime. It allows you to set up a problem instance that can mix classical and quantum. So you can look at uh, these more uh, harder problems by running the quantum, quantum system many, many times. And as an example, something like doing this chemistry problem uh, that we did a few years ago, uh, which would be 5 billion quantum circuits, uh, now goes down from something that had a medium time for each running of 100, 100 down to 20, 20, 20 seconds. And we'll get this further by a few, few more improvements. But this sort of new framework <coughs> of, of programming quantum computer that brings classical and quantum together is how I see the future going forward. And on that, I do wanna say we've published our roadmap and we're on target to delivering all of this. And I wanted to stop there and uh, open up to questions. Thanks a lot, Jay. Uh, wonderful talk with lots and lots of information. So if you have questions, please post them on the question and answer uh, here on the chat in Zoom. I can start with a question on my own, if you allow. So you, you just mentioned uh, at the beginning of the talk and in the end about these innovations uh, like Qiskit runtime, right? So, so that can decrease, that can make uh, this hybrid quantum computation algorithms run faster. So uh, will, will that allow directly for you to, to use feed forward, like to measure a uh, part of your system and then choose which unitaries to do depending on the results? Is that something that's already included? So that I put into, um, what, so I break time up into two and that feed forward is already included. Um, the so there will be two different types of time scales. There'll be, um, so I thought I, I was trying to find the slide I had on it. Just let me put this slide up. So there'll be the time scales that you want to do where you um, update a new circuit to run on the machine and you want to do that very very fast i call that um i call that um near time okay you want to do this in the milliseconds between each one of them i don't want to send any quantum information each one of them are independent uh circuit extended quantum circuits 
those ones, um, those we, we the quiz kit runtime, it, we've got this is what's given us basically the hundred. We, we we say it's about a hundred times speed up for for these chemistry applications, and it'll get a little bit more. Um, there are mul multiple things that go into that. Is is not setting up the electronics, not having to deal with uh, APIs, and not have and not having to tear tear up and tear down the environment for um, programming the machine. So it's more software engineering that has enabled that to be. So that that that's one side of it. Then on the other side, I I, I call this real time. This is the feed forward that you talked about. So in Open Chasm three, we specified all of all of those uh, real time. We've given you the ability that the the software <coughs> can call out to an arbitrary calculation. So that means real time and near time can come together. But now we actually have to limit it by what's practical in hardware. And so what our current electronics do is you can reset. Uh, you can put mid measurements, mid reset. Our updated electronics, which will come out at the end of this year, will do simple feed forward of, of uh, gates of what you said. Um, but we what we need to know and working with a lot of people that using and getting that feedback is there's a limited amount of computation that you can put onto the electronics in real time that can be done in nanoseconds, right? Like parity check would be one or majority vote, right? Or things like this. So to answer your question is by the end of this year, yes, but it's going to be limited in its computation. And I don't know yet what is the boundary of that limitation until we, uh, we try a few things. So simple things like teleportation, yes. Phase estimation, yes. Majority voting, yes. And all of those are important, obviously. You, teleportation, phase estimation, I don't need to say. Majority voting, because that's primitive for many of these codes that we want to explore how they progress, right? Measure these, do a majority vote, feed forward, and do some type of correction. But in principle, you could have a lot more flexibility, but there's practical limits on how many you could put into it. And that, 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 that I think is gonna be uh, over the next few years, innovation by but people using the machine, trying to do, us doing our own internal research will define what is the computations we wanna do in real time. Okay, thanks, thanks. It's, it's a very challenging problem. <laughs> so uh, Joaquin has your hand up. Would you like to speak up, Joaquin? Uh, yes. So Jay, thanks a lot for, for the talk. And let me also take the opportunity to thank you for you guys in, in IBM for, for, the, uh, for the whole program, the IBM Q. Uh, I guess you guys know this, but let me, let me say that uh, it has been also a, a great tool for education. Like we have been, uh, we had the, the chance to, to put uh, undergrad students in contact with, um, with your computers and that's very exciting as well, okay? So now let me ask you a question. Uh, this is more about our research on, on quantum simulation. You were saying you, you have this agenda to uh, to duplicate uh, the quantum volume every year. And, and also here on the screen, you're showing the, the number of qubits. So I was wondering uh, if you can forecast uh, when uh, you shall be able to, uh, or we shall be able to, to do a, um, uh, in, the, in the context of quantum simulation, something that we cannot do with, quant with classical computers, okay? We're, we're, when do you foresee that we shall have quantum advantage or quantum supremacy on, in the context of quantum chemistry in particular? Yeah, I, I always obviously get asked this one a lot. Um, so part of, I didn't get to go into this too much in the talk. I think we need to, so we, we came up with this technique we call error mitigation. And essentially it improves an observable that you want by running multiple circuits. And then you do some processing of the data to make that circuit better. Um, we applied it <coughs> uh, to limited chemistry experiments. The nice thing about simulation is generally you're asking some observables. So you could imagine I, I, I may only wanna know um, single qubit operators of my encoded problem or 
two qubit operators in my code problem. So things like error mitigation shouldn't allow that to be possible. And I think um, how well we can get that quality and how large we can get the system, I think we in the next couple of years will be crossing the point. I think the difficulty is going to be on how we as the uh, how we um how we uh, work out techniques that handle the noise in a reliable way for us to be confident. And I think that those those techniques are the uh, like if we if we follow this and we can get um uh, uh, say <laughs> I don't know thousand qubits in 2023 and we're getting close to four nines fidelity you're going to be able to run bigger circuits than you can just blindly simulate but turning this into chemistry and getting into something useful i think we'll have the hardware i'm not sure we'll know how to use the hardware and i think that <laughs> that's going to be uh the limiting obviously long term we know how to use it in full error correction, but the optimism in me says error mitigation and other techniques yet to be discovered of reducing, I, I like to think of them as the opposite of sensing rather than making my signal bigger, I'm trying to suppress all the noise in some way to give me the answer that I want. Um, I think there's a lot of innovation to be done there. So I, I'm optimistic we'll see something in the next few years. But I think there's a lot of work that needs to extend uh, on concepts such as error mitigation. <clears throat> I didn't jump into this, but one thing where we were excited by is um, so error mitigation was this. Uh, I didn't have it in. Is this technique of um, adding circuits together to suppress errors? And so this, what we challenged ourselves to do is, could we make a path? from error mitigation to fault tolerance. And we haven't got all the details, but what the team said, did is, is we imagined that we could error correct all the easy gates, but error mitigate um, the hard gates in, in some type of simulation. So T gates are generally considered the hard gates because they're non-Clifford, which means the overhead in doing these are much more than the overhead of doing transversal C knots and et cetera. And this technique uh, showed that it was possible to error mitigate these gates in an algorithm. And, uh, and, um, and so this sort of showed that there's this idea of maybe mixing some error correction and error mitigation as well. So I think we'll have devices that have the potential in the next couple of years. I turn it over to the scientists of how we, and of course I'm going to keep looking at it and my obvious my my direction will be to look at problems that that are interesting and only require measuring low weight observables but we know they're difficult to do classical and uh and and exploiting error mitigation okay thanks so we have a, another question from pedro Cruz, who is a student uh, here, who is using yeah. also the IBM quantum experience chips. So the question is two questions, actually. Well, the first one is about uh, improvements in the C0 uh, gate fidelities. How soon do you expect to upgrade uh, the current implementation and whether it's going to be based on cross resonance operation or, or something else? I think you might have mentioned that, but I, I don't remember. Yeah, so, <coughs> um, so we have so if you're using it, you probably went in, you would have seen all these uh, Falcon R1, R2, R3, R4, R5s, and sorry, R4s, R5s. So what they are is referring to revisions. And, and so the um, Falcon R4 is the current standard one. The R5 is a revision where we built in fast measurement. So we built in a readout that allowed it to go faster. The R6 is we're already building this in. So this type of gate with this direct interference, uh, we're already in the path of, of building it. So to answer your question, 
uh, very, very, very soon. So we demonstrated this on small systems. Uh, it is our goal to, to make what we call our exploratory systems, which are we build in a new feature. We put them in uh, uh, as, as soon as we got confident. So this was done in a, a four qubit sample uh, for, I forget, small qubit number of sample. Um, as soon as we got confidence they work, we, our goal is to build them into our larger. So R6, which is our next Falcon, already has this one built in and we're even designing this for a Falcon after. And so, um, yeah, so as soon, I, I expect to keep pushing uh, the error rates down at a great, at a pretty large rate, uh, fast rate. Nice, thanks. So the other question is, um, I see you expect to keep the heavy hexagon lattice architecture, right? You can see from these uh, the drawings, right? So this architecture for Condor, for example. Do you expect it to allow for hardware optimal error correcting codes capable of dealing with correlated errors? So the question is about error correction in the future and, and the structure. So um, I, I would love to know other grids that could be done. This one's nice because you can still do reasonably efficiently the uh, surface code on there. Um, you just take subsets of it to represent the encoding and then you uh, have flag circuits to get it out. So there's not much of an actual overhead compared to um, um, compared to the, um, uh, the standard uh, square ladders. Second is you can encode, you can, we came up with a new code that could be done on this that we call the heavy, heavy, um, heavy hex code. And it is the surface code in one dimension and the bacon shore code in the other dimension. <coughs> so it gives us the ability to study two fundamentally different codes uh, on the same and to learn some, some about it. Um, we don't have a, like, re, like with improvements in yield, we could go to different uh, lattices, but uh, I turn it back onto the community. What lattice is the best? And can we show that it's always fundamentally much, much better than the surface code? I would love to see a lot, lot more work done on low density parity check codes that have really complicated low weight graphs, because with this, this type of technology, we don't even have to be limited to this 2D, but we need to have a reason why to make it. And so if we're not limited to 2D, you can imagine quite complicated graphs. Uh, it's always been, uh, it's always uh, honestly a little bit of a chicken and egg problem. Tell me what graph to make. And then the other side is, well, make a different graph. And you're like, well, no, yeah. So we, if we knew what graph to make that was always better, we would, we would actively look at it. Thanks, thanks. So Joaquin, you have a, another question, right? Uh, yes. So this one is not about the future. <laughs> this one is about the past actually. Um, so I'm curious about what was the key development that made possible this uh, uh, the the what well, the apparent uh, qualitative jump in back in 2016, right? I mean, I was trying to to figure out uh, uh, how what happened, what was the special um, event, if any, that made it possible to go from uh, papers with one and two qubits or maybe three uh, uh, to well to MQ and and to where we are right now. So. The, well, a big, the first big jump was uh, when I started this field was obviously the transmon. Um, it, it was stable uh, compared to the other type of qubits. Um, then pushing coherence in it and understanding coherence took a lot. Then uh, um, getting gates, uh there were uh, getting gates reliably uh took a lot and that that came down to developing techniques to model the system much much better so this is where we came up with many of our techniques uh that we use and uh Kiskit metal is leveraging them to uh to design qubits at the right frequencies and get the right couplings right 
So Kiskit Metal, if you haven't seen it, is our open source tool for laying down architectures. <coughs> then, um, then we were limited by wire bonds for a while. So then you imagine you, all your stuff was in the same chip. You didn't have an interposer. So I didn't go into this uh, here, but this technology also has a, a flip chip. Like I, I need to control this qubit in the middle. So there's bumps and there's a, uh, there's a, uh, we, this is one, one chip has the qubits. The other chip has the readout lines that got rid of the wire bonds on the qubit chip. And a lot of this happened in the early days that has uh, allowed us to scale. So it's a lot of, um, a lot of microwave engineering. And I would say relearning microwave engineering. <laughs> like uh, there's a lot of, there were a lot of techniques that were done in the microwave engineering, not in quantum that we took and we added, I think there, there are a few papers from myself on different techniques of estimating effective Hamiltonians and they're leveraging, uh, they're leveraging many of the techniques in the field. Microwave. Okay, thanks. That was quite something. Mm -hmm. Well, I think uh, we're running a bit over time. Uh, it was great to have uh, Jay uh, for this talk. Uh, I'm sure people will be looking through the slides if you can make them available and then thinking of, of ways of going forward uh, from on on. It was quite inspirational. Uh, so I guess we can uh, stop here, uh, thanking uh, Jay again for his time, for his effort, for a very nice talk, and, uh, and see you, everybody, on the next uh, Quantum Portuguese, Portuguese, Quantum Portuguese Initiative Lecture, which will likely be in September, right? We have to get together and organize the next semester uh, schedule. So thanks a lot, Jay, and see you around. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, everybody who attended. Bye-bye.